My name is Sasha Dichter. I'm the co-founder and CEO of 60 Decibels. I will allow our panelists to introduce themselves, but we have a really great panel. Um, when I was asked to organize a panel, I my goal was to make it as um, technical and wonky as possible. And so I'm not. we're not actually, I think, going to pull that off, but the fact that you all read the session description and said, that's the one I want to go to, just it's a special group. And I, I feel like there's a lot of kinship here, and I'm happy about that. Oh, well, that's depends on how you all behave, actually, and, and on the questions. Um, so I'll, I'll give, um, I'll gi I'm going to let them introduce them, everyone introduce themselves in the context of what we're going to talk about, so I'll just do a second here. Um, but the motivation for, <clears throat> for this panel has been, um, I've been in the, this space for a long time, and specifically with 60 decibels in the social impact measurement space for a while, and the getting people to pay us for social impact measurement for a little while. And... Uh, it struck me probably a year or a year and a half ago, we were speaking to the CEO of one of our clients who essentially said, love your guys' work, nice, all these good things. It's kind of crazy how everybody kind of has to like look for money between the couch cushions to pay you all. Like, how's that going? Um, and the observation was a little bit more of a structural point, which is there is an increasing amount of social impact measurement happening. There are vendors like us and others who are doing it. But it seems to be that most people who are hiring those folks each are figuring it out for themselves how to pay for this. And I literally was talking to someone earlier today. I was like, well, should we pay? Should the company pay? How does it? Um, and it just seemed to me that this is not one of the things that we talk about that much. Um, and it struck me that there's some structural limitations that are keeping us back. Um, and again, the premise is that there's valuable social impact measurement to pay for, um, which could be a different panel. But I think it's up to the people who are doing that to show and create value. But my observation would be, and there are some ways that it makes it harder for even if that value is there for the people who want to use those services to avail themselves of it. So that's kind of the purpose behind the panel. Um, with that uh, as context, I'd love to, each of our panelists to just introduce themselves. And you could say who you are, where you work, what your role is. Um, and then after that, but not before, I would come back and sort of ask for your first reactions to the, to the thesis. So that's going to be. I was actually told that EJ was going to start. So. Oh, well, then EJ, over to you. No one told me that. I'm great. a terrible moderator. No, so. no, it's fine. Um, great to see everyone. Uh, my name is EJ Ogbeche. I've been uh, with Cambridge Associates now uh, for a little over four years, uh, but roughly 15 years in the industry and experience. Um, <clears throat> I uh, live in the Bay Area, in the East Bay. If you know where Berkeley is, exactly. Wife and three kids, uh, eight, six, and three. That's my life. Um, so as soon as this is over, I'm going to go do the pickups. My wife's out of town this week, so bear with me. Um, but more about the firm, Cambridge. Uh, folks often think of Cambridge as the uh, old school consultants. I, I don't blame you. Uh, that's how I felt when I joined. Um, Cambridge has been around for 50, 50 years, uh, starting as uh, you know, two research analysts at the Harvard Management Company, trying to help them uh, change their asset allocation from 50% stocks and 50% bonds to venture capital and energy, and including new sectors and, and uh, industries. Uh, fast forward, they now, uh, as a firm, we now work with um, you know, most of the uh, Ivy League schools, lots of universities, private foundations, health systems, pensions, and uh, private wealth uh, individuals. So uh, we sort of divide our house into research and folks that uh, work directly with clients. I sit on the client side. Uh, I work with um, endowments and foundations in particular. And what I love about my job is we get to think about their mission and think about their portfolios in perpetuity. And so I come to this conversation, um, having worked with many of my clients, are uh, have a focus on ESG or um, DEI. And so I come to this conversation having clients, these LPs, having asked me, you know, how do we get, what is impact? What is diversity? And having that conversation and digging deeper into what that means. Uh, so I, I join this conversation very humbly, but, uh, you know, with some context from our clients. So I'll pause there and let everyone else introduce Awesome. Um, my name is Kelly McCarthy. Uh, I am the head of impact at the Vistria Group, um, but I'm on this panel kind of wearing two hats. Um, I've been with the Vistria Group for, well, since January, but spent the bulk of my career, a um, little, uh, the bulk of my career prior um, at the GIN, the Global Impact Investing Network, um, where I was the chief impact officer 
And, um, and if any of you are in the room are familiar with Iris Plus, um, led the development evolution of that for the duration of my, my time um, with the firm. Um, but a little bit about the Vistria Group uh, and you know, context for this conversation. The Vistria Group is a middle market buyout firm, um, private equity, um, based in Chicago. Um, it's about 10 years old. Uh, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. Um, around 10 billion assets under management. Um, and we focus on healthcare, education, and financial services. Um, colloquially, internally, we, we like to think about this as the three pillars of a thriving economy. So if you think about like healthy, wealthy, wise, um, you know, really sort of constituting what is what we are striving for. Um, we recently added um, a housing fund, um, really under the the sort of philosophy that if you don't have a roof over your head, how can you even strive for some of these very basic things like health, wealth, and you know, and 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 education, you know, uh, a sort of uh, solid education. Um, we kind of, I think, uh, my perspective might be very different than the others on the on the panel, and I'll. Per moderator instruction, I will hold back my my opening remarks on that front. So my name is Leslie Cornell. I am a vice president and deputy general counsel at Social Finance. Social Finance is an impact advisory and finance nonprofit, and also a registered investment advisor. Um, we uh, really work with partners across sectors to try to. Uh, m mobilize, design, and manage innovative impact-first fund uh, investment vehicles or investments. And um, one of the real focuses of our impact investing team and us as fund managers right now is unlocking new capital, whether that is through community and national foundations, through donor advised funds, which is definitely a focus for our team, or even public dollars, and really to just try to catalyze that all for and towards more impact. I'm actually super curious, too, if it's OK, like how many folks in the room are fund managers or have or LPs? Some? Is there a lot of impact measurement professionals in the room? OK, great. Um, but yeah, Lawyers? So Wait, it was actually lawyers or? Lawyers? Oh, ooh, yay. Or friends of lawyers? <laughs> <laughs> Everything else? Don't like raising your hands? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, all I would just say, social finance, I mean, we've mobilized $350 million in capital uh, towards social challenges in the last few years, spanning from economic mobility to health care to affordable housing. So very excited to be here. Cool. So I'm actually going to do more polls to keep us, to reward everyone for coming. So, But, but I think that some of the <laughs> framing for all of the way we're going to approach this will probably come from us sitting in slightly different seats. So I would just, if each of you could say, are you, so are you, what kind of capital are you thinking about mostly, meaning private, liquid, et cetera? And also, to Leslie's point, describe social finance as impact first, if any imperfect definitions, lots of caveats, but impact first kind of mark. So if you could just situate yourself, because your comments will probably mostly refer to that, that would be super helpful. And then I have something for the audience. Yeah, I, th I think I already put, put us squarely. We are definitely a nonprofit, charitable purpose, and absolutely focused in the impact first finance space. Okay. Private equity. Um, the foundation of everything that we do is, is impact driven, um, but we are squarely market rate. Uh, we're also squarely market rate. Um, our clients are the asset owners, uh, and we also, in our network, are the uh, investment managers. So we sort of sit between them. But mostly funds? Uh, mostly funds. Cool. Um, and my perspective is also most like we tend to sell mostly to funds and corporations and do some other things as well. Okay, so from the audience, my Goldilocks poll would be I started by saying I think overall less than would be optimal high quality impact measurement is getting done. That's my thesis. And I'm just curious if you could just raise your hand for, you know, too much, just right, too little on that question. So those who think that too much, that's not a fair question, too much high quality social impact measuring is being done. I don't think I was gonna say it. But, but, but would anybody raise their hand for like too much just in general, like noise? There's a lot of you know requests for the, okay, so there's a too much, some too much on the like noise, lots of stuff. Um, just right? Oh. <laughs> no one thinks it's just right. Okay, one person thinks it's just right. We might make you argue for that point in a second. Uh, and too little. Okay, cool. That's helpful. Um, so uh, for each of the panelists, 
who, so my question, my first question would be, who is asking you to do your impact measurement? Um, and what I'm asking by that is, how much is it you all internally, because you mostly feel like, to do our work, like, this is our strategy, this is who are, versus it's more external, and if, if external, who are the external drivers of that? Like, I would just love if you could put some color around that, um, and whoever wants to take it first. Well, Leslie, why don't you go first, and we'll go that way. Yeah, sure, I mean, social finance, the impact, a, fo a laser focus on outcomes is embedded in our DNA. We were founded in 2010, 2011, truly around social impact bonds, which some in the audience may know, but pay for success contracting, out, outcome-based contracting, paying for outcomes is embedded in what, in, in what and who we are. And in order to uh, pay for outcomes and understand the outcomes of your work, you really need an impact, like a robust impact measurement and data collection and understanding so that you can make those assessments about what outcomes have been achieved. Um, so I would say that for social finance, there's, it is definitely coming from an, in, an internal place. Um, we, that's the DNA that drives kind of the work that social finance does as a nonprofit and especially in the impact investing sphere. But, um, I also think it's part of the value proposition that we offer to our LPs and the, the investors that come to work with us. And so when you think about if, it, it, I think that they are definitely out there asking for it, but when they come to social finance, they know that impact measurement is going to be embedded in the work that we do. They know there's going to be a focus on outcomes and that's why they seek us out. So I think it is internal. But. And in that conversation, if they have that expectation, yeah. how do they or you understand who is actually paying? And like, where, what bucket or pocket does that come from? Um, I think it's a, it, and I know that we'll kind of get into a little bit of where the different pockets are that some yeah. of this is currently being paid for. Yeah. And certainly for us, it's definitely a mix. I mean, it, it resonates, it, it comes from. From our out of our management fee for our funds, it comes. It's philanthropically funded in a lot of instances, especially the more robust our learning agendas get, the more additive and complementary they are to yeah. the project that we're undertaking. But um, the conversation with them is often uh, very laser focused on the very specific outcomes that they're hoping to achieve. Issue area specialization or expertise is often one of the reasons that they come to us, but how it's funded is not the first line of questioning. Right. So it's interesting. So if I could summarize, it is it is core to the value proposition. It's understood, like, this is why we'll do this with social finance. Yes. And yet, even so, there's some vagueness of how it will get covered. Absolutely. Great. Kelly, what's your favorite? Yes. Um, so, I mean, similarly, you know, Vistra was founded 10 years ago by Marty Nesbitt, Kip Kirkpatrick, under this idea that you could have purpose alongside profit, that you could genuinely be profitable if you did impactful things. So similarly, you know, it's in the, it's in the DNA. Um, and, and furthermore, similarly, you know, this idea that we can invest alongside. So basically, like, if you think about the three pillars, we're looking at public sector problems. We're looking at bringing private capital and private solutions to public sector problems. So we're trying to address some of those gaps in the market where, you know, some things are not necessarily moving along. So, again, under that umbrella, we also have to hold ourselves to a very high bar in terms of how we understand what are the issues and what are the interventions and what are the solutions and how our capital is going to actually help address those, those solutions. Um, and so, you know, I would say to your first question, it's driven very much by the, you know, the philosophy and the strategy that we have for our capital. But I will also say, and I'm just going to switch hats for a second. Um, I was sharing this with, with my fellow colleagues here the other day. You know, when I was at the gym, um, I heard over and over and over again, no one is asking, no LPs are asking for this information. No one's asking. It's only driven by the GPs. It's only driven by, you know, a sense of FOMO or whatever. And I call, you know, bleep on that. It's, it's not, I, that is not my experience at all. We have a significant number of LPs that ask us, I mean, literally this morning, I, I wrote out another LP request, um, just about our practices, about, you know, how we think about data, what metrics we're using. I mean, you name it. So, you know, whether or not that's unique to us, which I do not think is the case, um, you know, I, I will leave it there, but I will say that, in my experience, it's coming from a lot of different areas, and maybe that's just a sign of the times. LPs are getting a lot more sophisticated and thinking about how their capital is being um, deployed towards, you know, positive solutions and really holding their managers to account. And it would be helpful as we keep going, 
um, to describe what the data is, because I think there can be a lot of data, and it'd be helpful to understand like how how relevant you feel the data is, and how aligned are the LP requests to the things that you really think are driving change. Let, let's leave that, but I think it's an important backdrop because Lord knows there's a lot of data out there. But EJ, your take, yeah, just your I, overall, and if you remember the question. Hopefully. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> uh, I almost want to touch on the key key performance indicators yep. that you're talking about there, but um, who's asking us for these data? Um, generally, we're getting those questions from our LPs, uh, our clients who are trying to drive, uh, trying to communicate the impact of their portfolios. Um, but also, there are managers who are paying for this from their the, the management fee, um, whether it's a an explicit line item uh, from a third party that they've agreed to. Or um, you know, uh, part of their uh, part of their value statement, right? It, oftentimes, managers are coming to us saying we are impact first or, or not, but the statistics and the data that they're using to prove that they are impact first, low and middle co income wages or um, jobs uh, or you know greenhouse emissions, those data that they track have to be relevant to the business that they have, right? right. And so. If that, assuming that that is the case, uh, they're often the ones trying to prove those data with the fees that they're that, with the management fees that they're collecting anyway. It, it's a, it's no longer a, a uh, it's a value driver for them. It's not a, a cost center for them for managers who are impact first. And so, and my dilemma as the moderator because we had a prep meeting and I sort of started by saying, "Here's my premise," and Kelly and EJ were like, "Hmm, that's kind of not my experience." So. That's where we are, and and so we're a little bit trying to unpack that all just because we're all here and we want to keep this entertaining. I'll, my take on why that might be are a few things, and I don't know which one of these it is, and I'd love to hear if you all agree. One is kind of U.S. versus non-U.S. markets. One is kind of fund size. Um, sorry, and the U.S. versus global mostly has to do with the availability of data. Um, and then the third would be just kind of the quality of the data. And I'll give an example. Like investing into 60 decibels is a pretty mainstream private equity fund whose LPs have said to them that they need to get data from us on our impact. And so what we need to send them, we need to spend $1,250 to assess our carbon footprint. Like of all the things you would assess 60 decibels on from an impact perspective, that's like the last thing, right? We're like a remote data collection company all over the world. Like carbon is not material. So that would both, in my mind, fit under the data is being requested ostensibly about impact. But to me, it seems like the wrong questions. And so to me, the question would be, you know, this intersection of data being needed, data being provided, and a willingness to spend on getting the data, and the materiality of that data to your thesis around social change. And you know, I don't think we can unpack all of that. But that's um, just maybe you can take that as a backdrop and to the all the things I said that if you don't agree with, please take a shot at them. What I'll do is to get us to the specifics of the how you pay, because we're trying to keep this reasonably focused. Um, in, my, in my mind, there are either four or five ways to pay for this stuff. So one would be, and I'm thinking more private capital here, so please expand if you disagree, but in the management fee itself, the 2% or whatever that number happens to be. Um, uh, those of you who are talking about philanthropy, TA, whatever, but something philanthropic, something that's not functionally part of the fund would be the second way. The third way would be put it into the deal fees itself. So before doing a deal, you spend a lot of money on that transaction. It's totally normal to spend six figures on a transaction, and you could put it there. Um, or it could be in the LP agreement itself, which I'll leave as the last one, because I want to go into that one a little bit more. Um, and I guess the last one is the company could pay for it itself, which would be either in the deal or separately. So sort of those are the four ways. And I guess I'd just be curious when you hear those four ways, like predominantly, just like factually to give this audience, because it's a pretty diverse group in terms of how the kind of assets you manage, like which of those buckets applies to you? Um, what do you predominantly do? So maybe we can go, EJ, we can go this way back. This way. Yeah, I, I think um, predominantly we would focus on the LPs um, that are paying for this. Uh, or from the man the managers are asking, uh, the, sorry, the LPs are asking the managers to pay for this. Um, out of where? Out of the, the management fees. So the assumption is when they're, the, an LP is hiring a manager, the all-in cost is not just for the outperformance or the, the, right. the goal of the investment, but it's all the costs associated with that. So if it's impact first or not, the, whatever data you're pulling um, needs to support your, the, the ultimate return that they're, that they're looking for. And just to push on this a little more, do you, is that 
need and the cost associated with it specified in advance? Like if you're the manager who has a fixed pool and then the LP calls up and says, I'd like you to you know, do a triple backflip, you're like, well, that's really expensive. Like how does that work in practice? In practice, I've seen it as a, li uh, as a line item in LPAs or I've seen it um, uh, requested separately, right? Um, to verify from like a, a third party, like a tight line or something. Yeah, okay. Kelly, what, what buckets make most sense to you guys? Um, so maybe I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm, I might get at it a little differently. Um, so, you know, the way that we think about this, like, you know, people, you know, managers pay for investors pay for services all the time, um, and pay for value added services all the time. And your investors trust you to figure out what you need to, like, who you need to hire, what you need to do to kind of get at the return or the expectations that they have for you. So, so the way that we we think about this is very much in line with how we might think of of any vendor, any value added service period that we would be hiring or bringing on to help us with a variety of things with our investments. So I'll, I'll just kind of walk, I'll break this down across kind of the chain. Um, one of the things that we're really committed to is when you think about the impact that you expect from the investment that you make, I often have found that um, it becomes the sort of measurement, the understanding of performance, the understanding of like what's actually happening, is sort of an afterthought. It's it's so, it, and this I think gets at your your question about cost. I think when it is treated as an afterthought, when it is treated as separate from the deal making process, it becomes a cost center that sits in this very random, hard to assign place. In our case, we think of it as part of our underwriting process. So we actually, ahead of our, when we make a deal, we, we have a pretty um, robust theme process where we're really thinking through like, where do we want to go? What do we want to invest in? This is prior to even like sourcing. And at that point, we also outline a few investment or impact theses that we, we might actually be able to um, tackle. So when we actually find uh, a company that we might want to invest in, um, during the diligence process, we start to, I mean, like, so we have a lot of, I think, evaluators in the room or people who do IMM. So I'm going to say input output model. I think everybody knows what that is, like logic model. So we basically will say, what are the inputs? And have that sort of built into our model. Like really, really simply, like what do we think we need to put into this company to create to create the impact or to grow the impact that we think is possible with this particular company. And so we bake that in right away from the very, very, very beginning into our modeling to think about what goes in and how much, you know, what goes out and does this all make sense from an, from an economics perspective? And if the answer is yes, so, great. So when you say what goes in and what goes out, do you mean the value added services that you all need to put in or the logic model for the company to create impact? So it's related. So it's like, um, Let's say we have an early childhood investment, an investment in early childhood um, education. And let's say we are thinking about, um, we know that there are a variety of different communities that, well, first of all, I mean, I think everybody in this room knows that investments in early childhood education um, have long, long lasting you know, outcomes for kids um, throughout their, you know, their entire life. Um, there's a lot of evidence to show. So, but, but a lot of kids in certain geographies or communities do not have access to quality early childhood programs. So let's just use that as an example. We would say, well, how do we take a really good model and make it work you know, in other places or, or whatever? And I'm just using this as illustrative. Um, we would have to say in our, in our upfront, we'd have to say, okay, well, what, would that, what does that actually look like from a cost perspective, both so you, you have your financials, but you also say, to you know, bring these types of services to other kids in different communities, different geographies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, what does that actually, what will we have to do? What would we have to believe could be true? What do we have to do? And, and that's, you know, so that's, that's on the front end. But of course, when you ask yourself, what do you have to do? Then you have to also assign metrics to know if you're performing against that. You have to figure out your measurement plan to understand if you're on track, your KPIs and so on. So you're baking in just as you would do with any sort of financial KPIs, um, you're baking in from the onset what you would have, what would have to be true for the lifetime of the investment to know that you're on track with your your investment and impact goals. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Yeah. I well, we pay for impact measurement in a number of ways, and I think it's actually um, 
all of these resonate, but some of the, I think there's probably two unique characteristics of social finance funds that would be worth mentioning. One unique characteristic of, of, of our most recent social finance fund, which is our impact first fund of funds that we just launched earlier this year, um, is that we take on a significant component or a significant amount of that work for impact measurement and management in house. So we have developed the expertise and the teams and brought that into the social finance umbrella. Um, and that is not something that a fund manager necessarily typically offers. That's not an in-house function. And I'd be happy to go more into that, but I'm not sure how many people in the room that would be super ap applicable to. But there are unique challenges to paying for impact measurement for inter internal management teams. And we um, are on the cusp of trying to figure out how to allocate those costs effectively and fairly and, and, and in a way that's useful for our teams. But we're not quite there yet. And right now, most of that is coming out of management fees. And social finance and impact for uh, finance impact first fund uh, we aren't even offering market rate management fees we have below market management fees and we're trying to crowd in a lot of additional support with what we're offering as a fund manager the other thing that i think is worth mentioning because it does deviate a little bit from what how kelly is describing their thesis is that um, we have a lot of work and projects, especially in the economic mobility sector, where the impact that we're trying to achieve and the financial performance are just inextricably linked. Ooh, I was worried about saying inextricably. I think it went okay. Um, they, they, can't, they can't be divorced from each other. And so we really require that uh, the impact data that we're seeking, and that's one of the reasons that we've built that built that capacity in-house because we cannot have financial performance and these funds won't do well unless we are also having the impact that we're setting out to achieve. And so in that way, there they can it is it is difficult to move them away from um, a pricing component, especially think about a fund of funds. We're not able to set pricing and underwriting criteria at different levels up front. Those are set. Those are baked. We're entering into transactions with early uh, stage fund managers, et cetera. So we have to figure out other ways to pay for our costs on it from a different perspective. Right now, it is primarily management fees. Can I just say, can I just say, can I just say oh, can I just, right. oh, sorry. Just one thing. I, well, so I think there's a premise here that I want to make sure is very clear for us. Like we see impact as a core value driver. So like the, I think, and I think that actually aligns really well with what you just said. I mean, we literally think that more impactful businesses are going to be worth more period. And especially in the sectors that, that we're in, I mean, you take education, you have to prove outcomes. Like companies in education are not going to be better companies if they're not delivering high, you know, a high degree of, they're not, pro you know, proving their, um, delivering educational outcomes or improving literacy in healthcare. If you are not improved, like proving that you are providing quality healthcare, quality services, like you are not a competitive business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's, it's similarly tied to, you know, the strategy, the thesis, it's just deeply embedded. I, I would just chime in, um, cause you, you all brought up some really great examples. Um, but I would largely agree that, uh, as long as the information, uh, you know, is relevant and important, um, the goal I think that we're trying to get to uh, is just to observe the impact, right? Every investment has impact, whether it's an impact investment or not. It's a net impact, positive or negative. I think as an industry, we're trying to get to a point where <clears throat> we can me just measure that impact and have some you know, confidence in that number and be able to use it however we see fit. Um, but, but specifically, um, just for, for the education example that you gave, I, I thought that was uh, great because, you know, there are managers who are uh, early stage education managers who try to, you know, they communicate that diversity is very important to them and part of, the, you know, what they're trying to reach in their underlying investments. Um, and they have diverse hires even in their firm. But then when you look at the communities or the school districts that they work with, they're largely to, you know, rich or affluent students and you just see that disconnect. And I think where a lot of our, cl our clients, our LPs are pushing us is or it's to say, you know, dig into the, the, to the details of, this, of these data. Are they actually doing what they say they're going to do? Are they aligned with what they're saying they're going to do over the long term? And one point that I really wanted to bring in that I think would be, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about it was just where this cost is born isn't just with the LP or the manager. Um, it's also with, you know, the consultant who, uh, who is going in there and trying to understand or verify these data. Um, and you brought up a really good point about the smaller fund size. 
um, very naturally, if you don't have the resources, it's going to be a, a more of, a, of an issue for your fund. And we're, I just wanted to point out that of those resource, of those less resourced funds, or the smaller emerging managers funds, one through four, those tend to be managers of color, right? You see more uh, under more managers serving underserved communities in that grouping. And so, when you're thinking about the cost of who who's bearing the cost of of producing these data, I, th I think that's critical. And I, you know, I applaud to one of my clients for really pointing this out that. You know the diversity of the products and services that you know of the investment are just as important as the diversity of the team and, and things like that. So yeah, and I, I mean I would take that cost point a step further, which is um, the cost of the difference between the impact you claim to be having and the impact you're actually having is borne by the community, uh, right? So I going out there and I have a fancy fund funded by fancy people and I'm saying I'm doing all these great things for the world. If I'm not actually doing that, really who bears the cost is the community that's not getting the services uh, on whose backs um, those stories were being told. Um, I mean, I, I would love to push a little more on the, so uh, I don't know how many of you managed to come to the opening session of the, the impact measurement uh, track. But I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate something that Anthony Bug Levine said, which was that he was concerned that the level of discernment on the part of asset managers with respect to understanding of impact is very, very low. And I think he took it a step further to say, if that level of discernment with respect to so, uh, uh, impact, I said social because that's the area I'm in, but of impact, um, were that person to have that little discernment about financial and operational <laughs> metrics, they would lose their jobs, <laughs> right? And so I do think it's very difficult to answer a yes, no question on is there data, is the impact baked in without looking at this other axis of at what detail and what quality. And I'll, you know, my, I think, you know, slightly counter example, and it's again, it's possible it's different by sector because um, you mentioned uh, early childhood education or education, healthcare, where clearly you have to hit certain standards or simply you don't have license to operate. But, you know, we do, for example, a ton of world in the financial inclusion in the fintech space. And I can say with confidence that the thesis of fintech investors is we are going to create reach and access for people who didn't have that before. Even that is data that is largely unavailable. So there's just sort of this premise that you build a fintech in Mexico and you're reaching some unbanked people. So you don't even know that. But the other thing is, unlike an early childhood intervention, the access to credit could be good and could be bad. And the amount of information that's had by that sector writ large, which is a multi-billion dollar in valuation sector, around whether or not these are loan sharks or financial inclusion plays is almost also non-existent. So I think one of the issues is the discernment of what is high enough quality data that allows you to actually understand at a meaningful enough level whether things are happening. Um, so we could come back to that. I do want to get to, again, this, this LP agreement point, because uh, two of our panelists mentioned it, and it was one of the things that we did want to get out in this conversation. Um, what we have observed is, by and large, smaller managers, like the management fee is, I think, I would posit not the answer to this question. The management fee is vanishingly small, and even if someone has a $250 million fund, you know, any meaningful spend out of that seems to be highly constrained. Um, and so it would be helpful, and since you're our one lawyer, um, if you could explain, like, what does it mean to have these costs in the LP agreement? Um, like, just literally just explaining that to the audience, because it's a yeah. reasonably technical point. And then any thoughts on how, because I know you all have actually implemented that, so it would be very interesting to hear what that actually looked like in practice. Yeah, I was unclear if I should take my lawyer hat off for this part of the conversation or put it back on, but we'll keep on, it on. on. So I think like the um, – so fund expenses is a way that you pass through costs that the investment manager uh, is accruing during the course of – you know, their, their due diligence and passing it through fund expenses is the way that you can ensure that LPs and investors are paying for those costs directly because they are basically paying for those before any distributions are made out of the fund. And so it's a way for um, you to allocate and shift the costs of impact measurement directly to investors and LPs who are entering and into sorry, the And sorry, to be clear, it's typically things you just need to have to operate. Yeah. Right? That's why this category exists as a whole. So maybe you go. Yeah. I mean, so fund expenses, it's, and it's kind of fascinating, you know, 10 years ago, the market, how fund expenses were talked about 
was a very small, broad paragraph. And now we've got long lists of the things that go into what fund expenses are and what is allowed to be paid for by the, by the GP, by the investment manager through, through an investment. And, um, what is interesting is that in the market language, in the language that is used in most existing uh, fund documents, LP agreements, and the LP agreement is essentially just the agreement that our investors are signing on to saying that they're they're a part of the fund. Um, the language is broad enough to allow right now for us to be able to potentially build in this impact reporting, impact measurement. The cost of third party vendors and consultants is often language that is directly in there. So that exists right now. It's not a norm. It's not a standard in the space and certainly not outside of the impact uh, fund space. And and that's where then the risk comes in. That's where you're, you have to take a, a look at your fund. You, are you aligned with your LPs? Are they gonna support the impact man- measurement that you're trying to do? And the real solution to that, if you're not already already five years into a 10 year fund, if you're starting a fund right now, being extremely explicit about exactly what impact measurement you want to do, the services you're going to utilize, how it's going to uh, impact day-to-day operations and management of your fund, and building that and disclosing that directly into this fund expense section, what you're allowed to get paid for, is an is a great way to set that precedent. And, and and as we do that, the norms will shift. And I think one of the things that we've sort of thrown on is the things that are already expected in there are financial reporting, audits. Um, these are costs that are expected and understood and no one ever bats an eye. And impact measurement can be that. We can shift the norms if we explicitly disclose in our fund uh, expense sections that that's, that's what we're trying to do. And, and that's where this, this conversation came from, which was, uh, the second half of my intro was when that person made that observation, we started talking about this as a, as a structural answer to this question. Um, and I think it's the fact that, again, you're doing your audit, you're paying your legal fees, like it is the things you need to do to run your fund. And it just got us thinking about, well, if you have this particular orientation and your assessment is that as the GP, you are not able to gather the data to, to um, Kelly's point to know whether or not you're achieving these goals, like that actually seems like the place it should go. Now, to your point, what the words say, what your LPs expect, no, no one wants to surprise their LPs, right? What your LPs expect, what is, and what the norms are, are obviously going to have a major influence on this. So it's not only a legal question, I'm certainly not a lawyer, so you shouldn't listen to me. Um, But that said, our hypothesis was, if that became a more normed thing, then that will free up, not all the space, but it'll free up some additional space, both, as you say, to have the conversation up front with your LP saying, this is really what we mean. We're really serious about this. And to your point, not everybody's going to have the explicit value proposition of a social finance. But you know, for you guys also, Kelly, et cetera, like it's super clear, right? And to just say, look, this is part of what we do. Because I do feel like, as an industry, it, it, it has been a kind of an after the fact thing of like, we didn't really think this through, oh, you know, maybe we should do something here. And then everybody's scrounging. And it just undermines the the rigor, the quality, the thoughtfulness, all these sorts of things. So um, I'm just curious, any reactions on, on this point? I mean, Leslie just said that so perfectly. I hope everybody was furiously taking notes because that's like exactly, yeah. I mean, I don't have anything to add, just yes. I mean, do Ditto. we want? <laughs> I, can, <laughs> yeah. I think that I mean, I can I can start to get into the challenges of doing so, which is you know one of those is that uh, financial reporting audits these are ex- these are known quantities these are things that people expect they know how much they cost they know what exactly they're getting and impact measurement doesn't have that kind of standardization at this point and so um, the ability to uh, to, uh, to define what your impact measurement is, that's why I think that you really need that explicit disclosure of exactly what you're trying to incorporate and how. Um, and then we can create those norms. And then once those norms are created and there's more expectation of what impact measurement is anticipated to be passed through to your to your investors, not only is that good for making sure that that's paid for and that that's part of the fund expenses that are, are typical in the space, but I think that... Um, I like to think that it ultimately will lead to more standardization of the impact measurement and data that are expected across funds, across sectors. That way you have, if you if you know what costs you're allocating for it, and that's a norm and that's an expectation that your LPs have, that means that you have a better consistency and standardization of the data that you're going to get. Uh, just to touch on this point, because we did talk about smaller funds before, and 
it, it is very much my personal opinion that uh, you know, larger funds you know can lead the way in this respect, right? So, to those who have resources, you know, same like taxes, right? If uh, those who have the resources should be paying their fair share, and I think there should there could be a similar structure uh, for for these fees, um, such that it's not. Uh, you know, such an uh, such an issue for smaller funds as they grow, it, as they try to identify these key performance indicators that are relevant to their business for the long term. You know, it costs time and money, and it'd be ideal if there were larger funds who could lead the way. So as long as we we'll go back then to the tick off. So we just ticked off the LP fund structure. So if you go out from here and say, not only was I so um, not that I was so diligent that I went to panel after lunch on the last day of SoCal, but on top of that, here's this idea. You could pay for impact management in the LP agreement. Everyone's going to be like really impressed with your technical knowledge, so go do that. But um, there's these other categories we talked about. So just quickly, like it sounds like, and I'll just summarize from before, management fees is a way to pay for this. Leslie, you mentioned that you guys are doing that. I'll just I'll share my perspective, which is we talk to lots of clients. It's really hard for them. Um, of, and of, of clients of a reasonable size. And what the... Uh, what struck me once was we were talking to a client who was managing a new kind of $180 million fund. And I sort of thought, oh, well, they, they only really have the space. And they were really, really clear that that was really hard. So maybe we can skip that buck. But I'm curious about, in, uh, and maybe this is for you, Kelly, to start, which is in diligence, right? Because you also want to talk about norms. Like a typical deal will have six-figure diligence costs without a bat of an eye. You know, so the idea that you might spend whatever amount, 5000 30000 I don't know what, you know. Uh, and also similarly, by the way, like doing some customer discovery in just regular old deals is all, you know, you pay 50 grand to a market research firm all the time in diligence. So my observation would be that happens very rarely with respect to impact measurement work, but I'm just sort of curious, it sounds like you guys are doing that a lot, so I just wonder if you could comment on that. We definitely are doing that a lot. So that's kind of what I was trying to get at um, was, you know, when you think about the list, so, I mean, basically at the end of the day, right, every investor wants to have the best information they can in the beginning to have the most insight into how they can make money and create impact, in our case, um, before they make an investment. They want to have as much certainty as they possibly can. So, you know, you spend money in a bunch of different buckets, whether that might be doing, you know, like looking at compliance issues. You're going to probably bring in, you know, someone to look at like legal you know, any sort of like legal records, any compliance issues, you're going to have somebody that comes in and helps you look at the market. You're going to have somebody, you're going to bring in a bunch of vendors at the beginning, probably have your in-house expertise as well. Um, but we, we do the same. So, I mean, we have, um, and, and you know, this year we've been really rolling this out, um, in a lot more effect, but we have, you know, kind of a, a an upfront sort of screening process and scoring process and assessment process, um, to think about, again, current state and potential future state on the impact front. Again, going back to my input-output model, what would we need to put into the company? Again, remember that we're a buyout fund. So we, when, we, when we make an investment, it's, it's typically a control situation. And, we're, and then we're working with the management team on a bunch of different areas of their business to grow that business. Um, and it's not necessarily just scale. It could be a lot of different factors. It could be it could be quality, it could be geographical, it could be a whole bunch of different things. But we're looking at what are all those ingredients. And so again, you know, to this point, um, we will partner with folks who are you know, smarter than us on particular issues if we think that's something that is worth unpacking a little bit further before, during the diligence phase before um, we make that investment just so that we're as smart as we possibly can be. Um, so, so, yeah, no, it's, and I think it's a great observation. And, and again, we have seen that there's a lot more willingness to pay at that moment. Everyone's <laughs> motivated in getting a deal done. But I would also observe that that also seems to be the exception rather than the rule. But I, but I would say just to just try to draw this thread, it's not just like you know making that really educated guess because at that same point we set you know that impact thesis. And and I just kind of want to underscore underscore bold bold bold. That's at the same point where you're like, well, how am I going to know? after I make the investment if we're actually tracking towards. So you have to bake you have to bake those assumptions and those expectations into you can't just, you know, this is what I think we're gonna do and here we go, you know, off to the races and hope, you know, cross your fingers and hope it works. So, you know, again But we would I mean, I, I'll go I don't know if we'll agree. I would say the last sentence you just said is the predominant behavior. 
Yeah. Uh, yes. So. I think. I I think so too. Yeah. Okay. So. You're looking thoughtful. Okay, we, these questions are like so broad. <laughs> We're not supposed to start questions yet, but the questions are so broad that I'm gonna change that. Um, so, so one, this is just like interesting. And so the question sort of reads, our clients pay from revenues from sale of impact credits. I think this is W plus credits. I don't know what that means. For women's empowerment using W plus standard, similar to carbon credits. What do you think could be, could this be replicated as a market for outcome credits grows? I don't know if anybody in this panel, I don't feel knowledgeable in outcomes credits other than I think it's very, very, very nascent. So we could either just, that's information for everybody, including for me, but if anybody knows about outcomes credits markets and wants to comment, the or the person, yeah. Can yeah. you tell us what's, what, please? Yes. Yeah. So um, our W plus standard is out there and being used to measure women's employment at project level, generating credits that are tradable assets like the carbon yep. credit. Amazing. So corporates buy it and, and individuals buy it, etc. And so through the sale of that credit, and right now the recent sale, for example, is twenty dollars a credit, which is pretty high. And from that, a project then can I'm oh, sorry, a project can then from that revenue pay for the expense of the measurement and also it shares there's a benefit sharing of 20 percent of that revenue gets shared with uh, the community itself so there's enough money as a as a profit orientation for the project wow. developer or the company as well amazing I'd, I'd be curious where the supply of those uh, the credits are to, it, thinking about the the carbon credits the california carbon credit board and how they're you know removing supply from the market to help bolster the price curious how that plays into the W plus credits. Seems like a larger discussion. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so good information. Okay. Um, this person this person close to my heart says information is power. Use IMM for accountability strategy, marketing, and fundraising. If we said to regular businesses they should not do any of these things, it would be crazy. Why is it still so hard to get investors, others to pay for it? I agree. Anybody want to take that? Why is it hard? I mean, we have a little bit of dichotomy here in our panel. Kelly's uh, more optimistic that people are paying, but I'm curious overall, like why, why is it hard? Can, can I just, maybe this is, I, I don't know. I'm just going to say what I, what's on my mind. We Please. keep talking about it as a cost center. Like literally we're talking about it as a cost center right now. And if we keep talking about it as a cost center, instead of a value creation driver, we are going to continue to think about it as this, Ooh, you know, I don't know. I'll just like, see if I got some money over here to pay for this little nice to have thing. And I, I really, I mean, I don't, I don't want to like belittle it, I think, but I think one big part of it is we all have to be part of a narrative shift here and, and start to actually like literally underscore, I mean, a lot of the points that you were making about, you know, just like the, the, the way to think about an illegal agreement, you know, that can extend through to just this narrative, like we will create value on top, like these services are necessary for us to be smarter understand you know how your money is being spent where it's going what it's doing just like everything else yeah um, and and i mean for me I, what i couldn't agree more and i think that one of the things we have to acknowledge as a backdrop to this conversation is collectively we haven't done a particularly good job of um proving that this does create value right and i think there's new energy behind high quality impact measurement across the spectrum which probably didn't exist five years ago and certainly didn't exist 10 years ago so the brand, if you will, of the measurement of impact is like, really? Right. So that idea of it's, it's energized, you know, for us, when we focus on customers, it's, you know, we kind of pitch this as this is as much as anything, customer intelligence. And that does shift people's orientation. So I think it's an important point, but Leslie, you're gonna, or EJ, you want to? I was just going to say, this is also during the backdrop of uh, a challenging time for impact investors in general, yeah. where there's legislation and uh, over attacks, uh, yeah. uh, you know, downplaying the validity of this of these data. So, with that context, you know, I, I think I would agree even more that you have to have advocates. I would again implore the leaders and the the, the larger um, asset managers to be uh, you know front and center in this conversation because uh, they're representing a lot more than themselves. I think, I mean, just interestingly in the world that I'm in, and I, as I said, you know, part of the reason I think that we, investors come to social finance is the, the value proposition that we offer and the impact that we they know is embedded into the, the funds and projects that we're creating. So um, the, uh, 
there is no w way to really s separate that from what we're doing, and we don't have then the the questions that they're coming to and un are uninterested in paying. What is, I think, a question is what impact reporting and questions that they're asking for us to then give back to them, and whether that's substantive and whether that actually is getting us at the outputs and the impacts that we really are trying to have, whether the intervention has actually been successful. And so there is still, I think, a mismatch between um, what what our investors and LPs think of as impact measurement, and what we think of as impact right. measurement, and what we're actually trying to achieve with those with those costs that are part of the value proposition of the day to day operation and management of the funds. And just to fill in the blanks, that there's a level of depth or granularity that you see that they may not see. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would just stress the ongoing cost of this too. Um, to be able to measure something, you got to be able, you got to go back to it, you know, right. eventually and. It's, it's not just one year. You're going to have to devote costs to this over time. So, so I'll, I'll have two questions, and you all can pick which one you want to answer. Um, one is, does the impact reporting paid for their management fee, or I would say more broadly, cover metrics that are meaningful to the beneficiaries and meaningful, helpful to assess the logic model, which is kind of related to what you just said? So basically, are we measuring things that actually matter either to the human beings involved or to the planet? Um, in, in a substantive way, or is there just a fundamental mismatch between the dialogue that's going on between LPs and GPs and what actually matters at the company and customer level? I mean, I'll start because I do think there is a fundamental difference between, I mean, impact measurement is a continuum. There is not, there is outcome validation and data collection at one end and there is communities of practice, focus groups, user research. I'm sure Sasha could get much further into some of that and how some of that plays out. But um, it is on a continuum and how we're paying for it. Some of it is necessary for the operation and management of a effective operation and management of a fund. And some of it is additive. It's complementary. It adds to the it adds to the overall knowledge about the intervention that you're trying to deploy, about the population and how they would like to be and should be served based, you know, based on whatever social challenge that you're trying to accompany. So <laughs> what is definitely true is impact measurement doesn't mean one thing, and therefore it is difficult sometimes to determine where in that spectrum you are and where you should then allocate your costs. And, th and there's a related question, as you as if you both want to chime in, but there was just a very uh, factual, are we talking about output or outcome metrics was asked. And so <laughs> if you can just signal that as you're chiming in, that'd be great. Yeah, um, so I, I love the discussion about inputs, outputs, and outcomes, because that's exactly can, how we think about this discussion. We're focused on the inputs with our clients. We, we spend a lot of time uh, understanding you know, what is important to them, what they're focused on, so that we can be crystal clear when asking the question to managers or to uh, end users of products you know, if, if the, the service or product is uh, a net positive. Um, You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there because I think there are, there are other comments that I Kelly, did, did you want to add a post cough? I keep coughing um, up here. Um, I mean, I would just say I'm, I'm trying to understand the question a little bit more. Like the cost of impact reporting or the impact report. Can you actually? Uh, well, can, we got a few floating around. One was around outputs or outcomes. One was does I think I, I would paraphrase this one saying. Are you collecting data that are meaningful to you, investor, and your LP? Or are you collecting data that's meaningful to the beneficiaries and yeah. data that will actually help you deliver more value to them? I mean, them? it is so across the spectrum. So I would agree this is across the spectrum. I mean, let, let's so outputs and outcomes. I mean, you, you love it or hate it. Like, you do have to collect output metrics to understand changes over time. Um, there are certain things that just help you directionally know if you are making progress. And those are typically things that can be measured at the output level. In terms of what is um, re requested or reported, I mean, what we try to do, I mean, so, so no surprise, um, coming from where I come from, we follow Iris Plus very closely. We use it. Um, shocker. Total shocker. Um, but also, you know, what is embedded in Iris Plus, and if you don't, if you haven't or are not familiar with, um, you know, the five dimensions of impact, totally get familiar with that because it helps kind of bucket all of this stuff. But one of the core components of that is thinking about who are you benefiting and the degree to which this matters to them or is you know, sustainable in terms of the impact that is being provided. Um, and you know, the way that we structure how we think about it is, um, is very aligned with that as well. For us, um, and again, I can't take credit for this because I just joined the firm. This is very much in the DNA. But I am been, I've been so pleasantly surprised that I inherited 
LPs that want to be as educated about what we do. And so it is a dialogue. Um, as much, it's not just like this, hey, we need all this, t- this information, like, y- you know, with no context. There's a lot of dialogue, like a ton of dialogue. Um, you know, we're, lear- we're learning, we're sharing, they're learning, they're sharing. We, we have one LP who, um, you know, has been asking us a lot of questions about how, how they can, like, actually structure some of their questions back to us better. Um, and so I would just say I think that's awesome because we're aligning incentives, we're aligning reporting. Um, it's but it's as much about us. Remember, so, I mean, I want to decouple something. It's as much about the what we are doing as the manager. So how are we doing this as it is, and how what is the company doing? How are they how are they relating to the end beneficiary? So there's you know there's a sort of golden thread of. Of, of, of information and to the point that I think you were making that there's differences there. Like there's, there's different use cases and different needs for that type of information, but it all kind of falls under this massive umbrella that's called impact measurement and management. Cool. We have very interesting long questions that we're not all going to get to. I'm going to try to weave in. There was a question around should the, basically should the company pay um, the investee? And so I'm going to weave that into a, 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 a magic wand poll. So if you had a magic wand and the last option that you get to vote for would be some messy mix of all the above. So you can opt out and do that. But where should it be paid for? That's what this panel is about. So you get to vote for, I'll tell you what you get to vote for. You get to vote for management expense, TA, philanthropy, something, deal fees. So in in the deal fees, um, the LP agreement or the company. Like, what's the right answer? I'm just curious what this audience thinks. And then you get to say a messy mix of all of them, which is our current state. So who votes for it should be in mostly paid for by management expense of a fund. Interesting. Who thinks it should be a sidecar philanthropic TA something or other? That was good branding by me. Um, Who thinks it should be in the transaction and deal fees? Interesting. Who thinks it should be in the LP agreement? Oh, we've convinced some people of that idea. And who thinks ultimately the company should pay for this? And who thinks it should be um, all these things because it's all heterogeneous? Huh. Wow, we are all equally divided. That was so interesting. Um, any, d- does anyone have any strong views on like, this is the magic wand. This is not what's actually going to happen, which is the next poll, maybe. Um, yes, my, sorry? my only sorry, there's sorry, a guys. Yes, please. Question. Please. Is, are you raising your hand to, please. I've never seen passion around how it should be paid for. This is the best panel ever. Please. Well, I fully think it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, especially when you're looking at a diversified field, multiple stakeholders, organizations, different parts of the world. I fully think that it's not one-size-fits-all. And some, I would actually say it's then all of the above with regard to, um, you know, a specific use case. And uh, yeah, wonderful. That's very helpful. I just saw one minute, which I think means one minute. So uh, 15 seconds, I I will just say that as long as the process, whichever stakeholder is bearing this cost, as long as it's driving, it's not just a uh, transparency and reporting out vehicle that we're looking for here, it should be driving accountability and uh, a level of transparency um, and just engagement. And as long as that's happening, I think whoever's paying for it, Right on, because it's <laughs> na- it's nascent stages. Kelly, closing thoughts. I mean, I mean, I would I would just say we're bucketing so many different use cases under this broad umbrella that, unfortunately, I would have to say it's all of the above because yeah. it really is situational in terms of what you're trying to accomplish, how you're set up. Which I mean, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Absol- no absolutely. Wrong answers. What you're investing in can make a huge difference on whether you can whether you can even implement one of those options. And so um, it doesn't, there is not a one size fits all, but that does not mean that I wouldn't encourage um, more passing for fund expenses. And I also, I don't know the answer, but I do think I would just return to this point of norms and I'll just relay a story um, of one of our clients who was talking to us. And this is an operating company who has used us across um, seven companies annually that they pay for themselves, even though they have a bunch of investors for the past four or five years. And I was talking specifically about pricing because I had just gotten finished with talking to a fund manager who's managing nearly a billion dollars worth of assets and was complaining to me about how he didn't have any money to pay for any of this stuff. And I found that discouraging. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, um, but, and sh- then this woman said to me, you know, here's what we pay you guys. We pay for each operating entity three to four times that amount annually for their audit. 
And it's not a question of whether or not that's good or that's bad. That's just, of course, you can't exist. We can't run if we don't have audited books. And so I do think, to me, that that speaks to two things, though. There's no question fundamentally to the value of the audit to give you confidence that these are reliable numbers and a reliable business. That's the reason it's required. Even if, you know, as the person running the company, you may not feel like you can't get into next year without your audit getting done. You just have to do it. But it's providing value. It's providing trust. It's providing confidence. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us who are involved in this and care enough about this question to be here to say whatever measurement work we do with respect to the impacts we're having has to have that kind of value, whether it has to do with trusts, whether it has to do with value to end beneficiaries, whether it has to do with driving action. It has to create value. But if we do create that value, then there, there, I think the reason, you know, it's maybe going back to what you were saying, Kelly. When we create real value, the resources are there. And so the fact that we're having this conversation in some way is a chicken and egg problem of have we created enough value, but are we stuck in kind of a bad spot because we haven't created enough value? You know, and, and then conversely, I do think some of these mechanical questions of how this is going to be done, like it needs to be a little bit easier for folks to do these things. Uh, and the amount, and I would just observe, the amount of advocacy, you know, person X who's trying to do it the right way, you know, Kelly, the amount of alignment you guys have in your firm, I would say is amazing and I would describe as exceptional. You know, so what often seems to happen day to day is the amount of advocacy somebody needs to do to say, we're going to do this well, we're going to do this the right way. It's a lot of contorting. It's a lot of special cases. And I do think it's, it's when you look at other services that are known to be essential, like an audit, they have none of those characteristics. So I think you know, the goal of this panel was to explore some of that, but also to posit that somewhere between here and there, there will be a normal way that will be more clear, that will be more understood. And then you can do things on top of that. You can change that. But it won't be you know, one size fits, you know, sorry, special use case every single time. And I would just argue, having been in the field for a long time, that that specialness of this is one of the problems, not the only problem. Um, and if we can find a way collectively to socialize um, kind of more standards, frankly, and more standard behaviors, that, that may help us.